uh, to see uh, what is the nature that of such uh, additional stresses that might arise due to relative fluid motion. Let's consider uh, the simplest uh, molecular model for uh, the ideal gas. Because in that case, we have a simple molecular picture that we can use to kind of build some intuition about uh, the nature of this stress tensor uh, when there is a shear or uh, when there is relative motion. So let's consider consider an ideal so-called billiard ball gas with uh, the following macroscopic continuum velocity. Velocity, let's say, some constant called the shear rate. X direction. So what we have here is a velocity that varies in the y uh, direction, uh, but it's only unidirectional along the x direction. So if I draw a picture, say this y axis, the x axis. So what we have is a fluid velocity that looks something like this. You have velocity that decreases, uh, that increases as we move in the positive y direction, and that's always directed along the x direction. Now, in the case of such a velocity field, imagine that uh, let's take a surface uh, whose normal is along EY, so a surface that's oriented uh, along the y direction, or uh, a surface that is uh, uh, tangential to the flow direction. Now, if we zoom in, or uh, rather leave the continuum picture for a moment and imagine what's happening at the molecular scale. So I zoom in here, here is my interface. And now I have a bunch of molecules that have a large mean drift velocity in the forward direction, but they also have some jitter, uh, some random motions in the vertical direction. So let me show the mean velocity by these uh, double arrows. Uh, but you, as I said, you also have uh, components of motion in other directions because of random molecular motion. At the same time, you have motions here doing the same, but they have a much smaller mean velocity in the x direction. So now when these molecules are moving around, they will tend to bounce around and diffuse across the surface. So there will be an exchange of molecules from the top to the bottom. But what this exchange will do is that the molecules going from below the surface to above the surface will tend to decrease the mean velocity of the fluid above the surface and vice versa. And at a continuum scale, it will look like, uh, because at continuum scale we don't see this diffusion, it will appear that the fluid below the surface is slowing down the fluid above the surface. Or, and also that the fluid above the surface is trying to accelerate the fluid below. And this will appear like surface forces that act tangentially. In other words, at this interface, we would have a surface here that acts in this manner. So if I look at uh, what is the force acting, uh, let's be more precise. So if I ask what is the stress E acting on the surface uh, if, where the normal is in the EY, I'm basically asking uh, what is the forces, force being exerted by the fluid above the surface on the fluid below the surface. And this would be a force uh, that is accelerating the fluid below the surface. So it, it would be acting in the positive x direction. In fact, it would be P by x based on a notation of the stress tensor because it's a, it's this, it's a component that's uh, acting in the, in the x direction but on surface oriented in the positive y direction. Uh, Whereas you would have the opposite force. If I consider what would be the stress vector exerted by the bottom fluid onto the top fluid, I'd have the normal pointing into the bottom fluid. Uh, so it's T acting on minus EY, that would be minus T by X. So anyway, the point here is that you can see from a, a simple molecular picture of this billiard ball gas, that the 
diffusion of molecules across the surface would lead uh, in the continuum picture to the emergence of a surface uh, stress force that would be tangential to the interface. So the key take home message from this example is that uh, relative motion of fluid leads to let's say shear stresses as they are called uh, which are tangential surface uh, which uh, let's say surface directed perpendicular by which I mean the surface normal surface whose normal is directly perpendicular to the flow you have this feature so yeah at least in this one case it's clear that the stress uh, due to fluid deformation is not going to be uh, normal to the surface uh, however at the same time uh, one would imagine that if you stop this motion uh, and get a static fluid you would recover the purely normal stress so this led to the idea of writing the stress tensor for a moving fluid So if we consider an equation for a moving fluid, the above discussion uh, would motivate us to write the stress tensor in general as a sum of the pressure force that acts uh, on the static fluid plus another component which I will place by tau, uh, which uh, denote by tau, which has been called the DVA toric. Yes, which is the stress purely due to the fact that the fluid is in motion. Now, what should this deviatoric stress depend on? So you see, now we begin our process of making an educated guess about uh, the nature of the constitutive equation. And the first step in that is to ask uh, what should uh, the deviatoric stress tau depend on in general and we narrow down this uh, dependence so well as we said it's uh, it's non-existent for a static fluid so we could start by postulating that uh, deviatoric stress should depend on the velocity field uh, but then we would recognize that no that it cannot be so uh, general because uh, we would expect uh, we would not expect to have any contribution to tau uh, if the fluid is uh, if fluid is simply translating, for example. Right, so if you have a purely uniform motion of the fluid, uh, so that the relative pieces of fluid don't move uh, differently relative to each other, then our simple molecular picture will show that the exchange of uh, uh, molecules between different uh, layers of fluid won't lead to any stress, because the fluid everywhere is moving with the same speed. So uniform motion, a uh, uniform V should not lead to any contribution uh, of deviatoric stress. So therefore we know that this relationship is too general. Instead what we want to say is that uh, the deviatoric stress should depend on, uh, should uh, only depend on the relative, uh, relative motion. That is, uh, it should depend only on the differences of velocity. Moreover, uh, we would also expect that uh, this deviatoric stress should only have, should only depend on the local uh, flow state. By which I mean, imagine you have a fluid in motion uh, uh, across a large domain. Uh, so let's consider, for example, you have some sort of flow like this. You have some circulations going on. Yes, now if I want to find the deviatoric stress here, I won't expect the deviatoric stress here to depend on the state of the fluid uh, somewhere far off here. Yes, rather I, it's natural to expect that the deviatoric stress in a fluid depends on the nature of the fluid or the state of flow in the fluid at that point, which is this is the simplest uh, starting point. And so we also say that the deviatoric stress is local, in which case it should not depend on the velocity on the uh, 
relative velocity field everywhere, but only on the local uh, velocity differences about the point where we want to calculate the derivative stress now. So these two things together imply that tau should in some way depend on a small change delta u uh, that exists about the point, uh, let's say x in its neighborhood delta x. Oh, so I'm writing this in a rather clumsy way. Rather, let's say that tau should be a function of delta u at the point x where we want to find tau. So what is this delta u? Well, by de let's draw a feature to get a better idea of what we are saying. So let's say you have a point here x, and about this point x, we want to find uh, the relative motion. So I want to find tau at this point. Well then, what I want to know is how does a piece of fluid just above it, let's say it has a velocity u. Uh, what is the difference between the velocity just above that point and the velocity, let's say, just below that point, prime? Yes, so that is what I mean by delta u is going to be equal to u minus u prime. Or in other words, it's simply u at x delta x let's say minus at x. So for a small change away from the point of interest uh, x I want to know how the velocity changes. If this delta u is 0 I expect the derivative stress to be 0. This is the idea. Okay but now I can expand oh sorry everywhere I've used u to represent the velocity uh, earlier I've used v so let's just use it interchangeably for now. Okay, so u is the velocity vector and uh, what I want to know now is um, actually to be consistent I'm sorry I keep missing this up so let's just call it v yes this is v everywhere v, v is the velocity vector it's v at x plus delta x minus v at x I think I've said changes I just to maintain nomenclature with uh, we have used earlier. Okay, so delta v, the small change in velocity, is can be expressed this way. But now I can use a Taylor series expansion, a multi-dimensional Taylor series expansion, to write this out. So this difference, uh, by Taylor expanding this term, just is simply v at x plus delta x dotted with. Remember, in component form. So it, it would be dotted with the gradient of the velocity vector itself. So these portions cancel out. Uh, what is this exactly? Well, if I expand it out in Einstein uh, notation or in component form, it's simply the derivative of the ith component xj component times delta x. So this is just the Taylor series written out for each component. And this is a matrix, a stress tensor iterating over i and j. And if I write it in uh, vectorial form, it's uh, grad v dot dx dot delta x. Uh, so what we obtain now is that delta v is equal to gradient of the velocity dotted with delta x. So from this, we see then, so then uh, our statement that tau depends on local relative motion translates to the fact that tau is a function of the gradient of velocity at that position. Yes, so things start to look a bit simpler. This means that we can relate the stress tensor to the local velocity gradient. Uh, and that's much simpler than having to relate it to the velocity field itself uh, or to the velocity gradient all over the domain. Rather, we're saying the stress tensor only depends on the local velocity gradient. But actually, we can simplify things even further, right? But why? Because uh, uh, tau uh, should not. Let's say be generated 
by uh, solid body rotation. So I'm, why this I mean that if a fluid is simply rotating around like a solid body, then there will be no relative motion of pieces of the fluid relative to others, even though the gradient of velocity about the axis of rotation will be non-zero. Uh, to see this, uh, we would have to split up the velocity gradient to symmetric and anti-symmetric components. So we can write the velocity gradient as grad v plus grad v transpose by 2 plus grad v everywhere is a 10 minus grad v transpose. So you see I have added and subtracted the gradient of velocity uh, by 2. So if I were to add this, I will get back grad v. And this component called E is the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor. And this is the anti-symmetric part. We will call it R for the reason that will become obvious in a moment. So now the point is that one can show easily uh, that the symmetric part of the tensor is what leads to deformation of the fluid, whereas the rotational part uh, leads only to, whereas sorry, the anti-symmetric part leads to pure rotation. Uh, there are a couple of ways to see this. Uh, first, purely algebraically, one can, uh, what we want to know is to find out how, let's say, a line element deforms. So again, let's say we have the point x here, and I draw a line between two points around it. And let's call this dx. Uh, if the fluid element deforms, I expect the length of this line to change. So for example, it starts out here, and if the fluid here is moving faster than or moving in opposite directions, after some time, the line element dx would get extended and stretched out. So what I would like to know is how the uh, time derivative of delta x dotted with delta x varies. Yes, and how this is related to the gradient of velocity. Well, to do this, I just simply go back to the idea that we already derived that delta u, which is nothing but delta x uh, derivative, yes, is equal to remember sorry, the velocity gradient grad v dotted with delta x. So now if I dot delta x on both sides of this equation, yes, so if I take the dot product of delta x here and I do the same thing here. Yes, what I get, so by acting the dot product on this term, what I get then is dt of delta x dotted with delta x Sorry, so here I have to apply the chain rule, so I'll get 1 by 2 coming out of it, right, because, um, yes, if I pull it into the derivative, I'll have half of uh, dt of delta x squared, which is the quantity I'm interested in, the amplitude of the small elemental uh, line segment, uh, that this must be equal to delta x dot and v dot and now if I use the decomposition into symmetric and anti-symmetric parts, let's not forget our vectorial arrows. Uh, I'll have two, comp two parts to this. And now you will see that uh, because this is an, this is an anti-symmetric matrix, which means let's say in two dimensions uh, for simplicity, it has the following form. So if I take the dot product of this with delta x on both sides, what I'll ultimately get is that uh, the first dot product and the second will cancel out because these have an equal and opposite uh, sign. So this term will cancel out and you can verify this uh, simply because R is anti-symmetric. On the other hand, this term will be non-zero and positive because E is a uh, symmetric and symmetric matrices are positive definite. I'll expand on that in a moment, but it's known that the uh, double dot product uh, of a positive definite matrix gives you a positive result. Uh, 
So this is uh, ultimately just delta x dot e, which is metric dot delta x, and I know that this result is called my non-zero. Yes, so what this means is that due to a velocity gradient, the line element that I consider uh, delta x will deform, but it will deform only due to e. Yes, so it's only the symmetric part of the velocity gradient that leads to local fluid deformation and not the rotational part. Okay, I remember I promised that we can see this in another way. So let's do that for a moment. Again, let's write this down here. And let's uh, stick to two dimensions for the moment. Although everything I say is extendable to three. So now we know that if a matrix, uh, okay, so we are, we're talking about a symmetric matrix. Uh, let's do the discussion in the following way. Let's begin with the simplest, uh, simplest possible uh, symmetric matrix. Right, this is just a diagonal matrix. Yes. So a diagonal matrix in 2D would look something like this. Uh, let me call, they have 0, 0 and 2D. So let's say this is sigma. Then this must be minus sigma. Why? Uh, because for an incompressible, let's just talk about an incompressible fluid. For an incompressible fluid, I know that the trace of grad V should be 0 because the trace of grad V is nothing but the divergence of the velocity. Uh, so these the trace has to add up to zero in general, and since R has a zero trace by definition, the trace of E must be zero. So anyway, if it's a purely diagonal matrix, you will you're forced to have the term sigma minus sigma in two D. If you're in three D, you can have you will have three diagonal terms, but uh, they will have to add up to zero. Now the point is, uh, remember the deformation of a line element, the time derivative of the deformation of the line element. Uh, would be given in this case uh, if I just focus on E by this symmetric matrix times the components of delta x. Yes, so delta x one delta. This would be the rate of change. So what does this mean? Well, if you act it out, you will see that uh, this just leads to an exponential. So delta x one is going to be equal to e to the power sigma t delta x1 at time 0 and delta x2 is going to be uh, e to the power minus sigma t delta x2 at time 0. So this means that if I draw my axis, this is x1 direction, this is x2 direction and let's say I start with points on a circle. I know that uh, line elements along the x1 direction are going to expand exponentially whereas line elements on the y direct, x2 direction are going to shrink. So after some time, my circle is going to start looking like an oblong ellipse. Sorry, I didn't draw that very well. Yeah, it's going to shrink in this direction, find proportionally in the other direction. So anyway, excuse my drawing, but the idea is that uh, it will expand, it stretch along x1, compress along x2 in such a way that the area is constant. Why? Because sigma 1, uh, 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 is uh, minus uh, I mean, minus sigma uh, plus sigma is zero, uh, which basically enforces incompressibility. Which means that because the fluid is incompressible, the area, which in two D is the volume, remains constant. Okay, so this is the action of the a diagonal uh, part of the uh, velocity gradient of, of the deformation uh, of the symmetric tensor, which leads to deformation. Uh, that is the symmetric part of the velocity gradient tensor. Is also called the deformation tensor because it causes deformation. And if the deformation tensor E is diagonal, then this is its action. However, in general, E need not be diagonal, uh, but every E can be diagonalized. Why? Because, uh, as you know from matrix algebra, because E is symmetric. Right, and therefore has uh, real eigenvalues. 
and uh, most importantly orthogonal eigenvectors so what this means is that for any given e the action of e on a small uh, region of fluid will always involve uh, expansion and contraction in different directions uh, and those directions will be the directions of the eigenvectors the only difference is that the eigenvectors need not be uh, naturally aligned uh, at every point in the fluid with the cartesian axis uh, but it will be uh, rotated relative to the cart cartesian axis because even the eigenvectors are orthogonal so in a general case for example uh, i might have excuse me i might have uh, the axis rotated uh, but you would still have the same action where a starting sphere uh, might be distorted along one direction expressed along one direction compressed along the other in a way that maintains the area and the same principle holds in 3d where if i start with a spherical amount of fluid it will get stretched into a spheroid uh, there could be stretching along one direction compression along two or stretching along two and compression along one uh, but the sum of the eigen values must go to zero so there should always be compression or stretching along at least one you can't have stretching and compression or compression along all directions otherwise you would change the volume uh, and now uh, the eigen values here which control the exponential stretching these eigen values are called the principal uh, strain rates for obvious reasons because they give us the rate at which uh, a vo volume of fluid gets strained along the different uh, eigen vector directions and the eigen vectors are called the principal Uh, rate of strain direction. 